Good afternoon and welcome. This is the Labor Forum here on WRFG 89.3 FM. My name is Diane Mathewitz. I'm a retired auto worker. I want to welcome you to the program. Co-host Paul McLennan with uh, Transit Workers Union is here. Hi, Paul. Hi, Diane. Tamika Atkins uh, with the National Domestic Workers um, chapter here in Atlanta is at you in the studio. Hi, Diane. And we're uh, about to give you just a great show again um, with all kinds of labor news and information important to working people and their families. Uh, as you know, the opinions expressed on this program may not necessarily be those of the Board of Directors, staff, or volunteers here at WRFG. I do want to remind everyone that this is February and that people talk about love in February. And uh, we want to remind you that we are running a campaign of, for the love of WRFG to help us get through these winter doldrums, which is when our finances get a little bleak. Sometimes it's like the weather. Um, and we want to encourage you, if you can, to make a donation out of love for WRFG. You can go online at WRFG.org or you can mail a check uh, to our station address, which is 1083 Austin Avenue, Northeast, and that zip is 30307 here in Atlanta. And so we'll begin our program with our labor headlines. We're going to then move into this week in labor history that Paul gives us. And we have Tamika, who will talk to us about some of the upcoming events. And we also have in studio with us uh, Kajalyn Kwajalein Jackson, who is going to talk about how it might be possible still to have Medicaid expanded here in Georgia. And that will be a most informative program, so I encourage you to tune in. And if you want to let your friends know, they can, of course, listen to us on radio at 89.3 FM, on your computer at wrfg.org, on your mobile app, and of course, those of you who want to watch us, you can go to the Labor Forum YouTube channel and watch us as we do this program. We will start with uh, the labor headlines for Monday, February 9th. The fight against global austerity, the, uh, the fight against the global austerity program of the bankers and corporate bosses saw a significant leap forward with the electoral victory in Greece of the Syriza party on January 25th. It has emerged out of the devastation caused by massive budget cuts, the elimination of basic social services, and privatization of public assets ordered by the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, and the European Commission. These entities are referred to as the Troika. The people of Greece, union workers, students and youth, pensioners, women and immigrants, and many more, have mobilized multiple times with massive demonstrations and rallies, occupations of public spaces and general strikes, trying to stop the bankers' seizure of their country's wealth. They responded to the anti-austerity electoral program of Syriza and have put it into office, and they now expect real change. The new government almost immediately issued a number of important orders, such as the removal of the barricades that insulated the parliament building from the people. Privatization schemes have been halted, pensions reinstated, the minimum wage brought back, fees for prescription and hospital visits scrapped, restoration of collective bargaining rights, rehiring of public workers, and the establishment of citizenship for immigrant children born in Greece. Hundreds of thousands gathered to show their support for these measures as the European capitalists claimed there would be no debt relief from the billions of euros lent to the previous pro-business governments. The vast majority of that money went to save the banks. The situation is fraught with danger. European financial powers such as Germany, internationalist capitalist bodies such as the IMF and the U.S. ruling class do not want to concede to mass resistance and are sure to attempt to crush this uprising. Syriza did not win with enough votes to form a majority government and has blocked with a small right-wing party which has been given the post of heading the defense ministry. The electoral victory in Greece has encouraged people in other countries, such as Spain, similarly devastated by the global capitalist crisis, which saw its own massive demonstration of hundreds of thousands in Madrid on January 31st. Listeners, I don't know if you can hear the rain that is pouring down outside. 
and oh, it's hail in Atlanta, but uh, we are pressing on. Um, as reported last week, members of the United Steel Workers in California, Kentucky, Texas, and Washington began a strike February 1st at nine plants run by Royal Dutch Shell. These refineries produce 1.82 million barrels of fuel a day. This is the largest work stoppage since 1980 when a strike lasted three months. On Sunday, yesterday, February 8th, another 1,440 workers at BP refineries in Indiana and Ohio joined the strike, bringing the number of affected refineries to 11. The overall issue is safety. Oil and gas workers are six times more likely to be killed on the job as an average worker. In January 2015 alone, just last month, there were four pipeline accidents resulting in explosions or spills that endangered local communities as well as workers. The union claims that the highly profitable oil and gas companies are subcontracting out work to companies whose employees are not being properly trained, resulting in increased unsafe conditions. Other unions, such as Nurses United, have joined the picket lines in solidarity with the demands of the steel workers for a safe and well-paid job. And locally, Teamsters Local 728 announced a victory for Greg Weiss, a Coca-Cola truck driver who filed an NLRB complaint that he was fired by the giant beverage company for his union organizing activities in 2012. Greg won a settlement of $42,500 and is now employed as a union driver for another company. Congratulations to the Teamsters. And that's our labor news for this week. We'll go with Paul, and uh, we have another interesting chapter in labor history. Thanks, Diane. An abolitionist, human rights leader, writer, and orator, Frederick Douglass was one of the most important African-American leaders of the 19th century. Born in the year 1818 on the eastern shore of Maryland, he did not know his exact birthday like many born into slavery. His mother named him Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. Later in his life, he changed his name to Douglass and chose February 14th as his birthday. Separated from his mother when only a few weeks old, he was raised by his grandparents. During his time as a slave, he witnessed firsthand brutal whippings and spent much time cold and hungry. When he was eight, he was sent to Baltimore to live with a ship carpenter. The carpenter's wife taught him the alphabet. Her husband refused to allow her to continue her instruction because it was unlawful to teach slaves how to read. So Douglas took it upon himself to learn. He later often said, knowledge is the pathway from slavery to freedom. He spent seven years in Baltimore before being sent back where he was hired out to a farm run by a notoriously brutal slave breaker. He escaped from slavery in 1838 at the age of 20. In 1845, he published his autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself. He then went on a speaking tour of Ireland, Scotland, and England in order to avoid recapture by his former owner, whose name and location Douglas had mentioned in the book. Because of his experience in Ireland, he became known for advocating Irish self-determination. He came to view his fight against slavery as belonging to a larger global struggle against all social injustices. Douglas welcomed the Civil War in 1861 as a moral crusade against slavery. During the war, he worked as a supporter of the Union cause and emancipation, a recruiter of black troops, and an, as an advisor to President Abraham Lincoln. His, life work, his life's work ranged from his abolitionist activities in the early 1840s to his attacks on Jim Crow and lynching in the 1890s. For 16 years, he edited an influential black newspaper and achieved international fame as an inspiring and persuasive speaker and writer. In thousands of speeches and editorials, he indicted the systems of slavery and racism and made connections between the issues of race, gender, and class. Douglas embodied the concept 
of what black feminists were later to call intersectionality. He saw the relationship between different forms of oppression and throughout his life he worked to build bridges between various movements for liberation. He was a firm believer in the equality of all people, whether black, female, Native American, or recent immigrant. Douglas famously said, I would unite with anybody to do right and with nobody to do wrong. He participated in the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls in 1848. Douglas noted the link between abolitionism and feminism, the overlap between the constituencies. Addressing the cause of women's suffrage, he said, all good causes are mutually helpful. The benefits accruing from this movement for the equal rights of women are not confined or, or limited to women only. They will be shared by every effort to promote the progress and welfare of mankind everywhere and in all ages. Douglas repeatedly urged the labor movement to open its ranks to African American workers. In an address to the Convention of Colored Men in Louisville, Kentucky in September 1883, Douglas urged labor unions to freely enlist African Americans in their struggle to obtain an eight-hour day, better working conditions, and higher wages. In what we have to say for our laboring class, we expect to have and ought to have the sympathy and support of laboring men everywhere and of every color, he said. One of the little-known facts about Frederick Douglass is his advocacy of equal rights for immigrants, especially Chinese laborers. In a speech that Douglass made on December 7, 1869, he attacked the discrimination and violence the Chinese immigrants were facing. Douglass became the first African-American nominated for Vice President of the United States as Victoria Woodhull's running mate on the Equal Rights Party ticket in 1872. This marked the first time that an African-American appeared on a presidential ballot. From 1889 to 1891, he served as U.S. Minister General to the Republic of Haiti. On February 20th, 1895, Douglas attended a meeting of the National Council of Women in Washington, D.C. During that meeting, he was brought to the platform and received a standing ovation. Shortly after he returned home, Frederick Douglass died of a massive heart attack or stroke. Brilliant, heroic, and complex, Douglass became a symbol of his age and a unique voice for freedom and social justice. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have the exact measure of the injustice and wrong which will be imposed on them, he said. His life and thought will always speak profoundly to the meaning of being black in America as well as the human calling to resist oppression. Frederick Douglass Presente. So I know a lot of people will talk about February 14th as uh, there are many other um, anniversaries and events. And uh, Tamika's got some as well for us. So she's going to give us a little update on things that you might be able to go to, attend, participate in. Thanks, Diane. So on February 14th, uh, One Billion Rising is hosting a gathering, Rising for Revolution, uh, 12 p.m. at City Hall, you learn the dance. 1.30 p.m., there will be dancing and singing and drumming, and that will be at City Hall uh, this Saturday um, on February 14th. Also, Can I just interrupt? A little background about what One Billion Rising is about. It really comes out of the struggle against violence against women, and it's an international movement with literally millions of women and supportive men, allies, in the streets, in countries, in cities all across the world, including here in Atlanta. They garner a lot of attention with their organized routines. It's a great way to bring awareness of the cause. Uh, also on February 14th, uh, there will be several bus trips from Atlanta to Alabama to no, uh, that's Montgomery. Uh, Mon no, it's on the 14th is Raleigh, North Carolina. Raleigh, North Carolina, I'm sorry. Yeah. Forward Together is hosting an event on February 14th uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina. The Coalitions for the People Agenda is celebrating the 50th anniversary on the March on Selma. The uh, March 8th weekend. Thank you. The weekend of March 8th. Some other events coming up in Atlanta. On Tuesday, February 17th, 
Ai-jun Poo, author of the newly released The Age of Dignity, Preparing for the Elder Boom in a Changing America, will be here discussing her new book, which shines a light on the millions of caregivers, both family and professional, who care for our nation's aging seniors. That's next Tuesday, February 17th at 7 p.m. at Karis Bookstore, 1189 Euclid Avenue Northeast. For more information, you can call 404-567-9451. Southerners on New Ground is hosting an event Sunday, February 15th called Love Letters to Kai. The event is to bring awareness to Kai Peterson a black trans man who's imprisoned for defending himself against his attacker. We will be creating art to show love to Kai in celebration of Valentine's Day weekend. The event is at 2 p.m. at HodgePodge Coffee House, 720 Moreland Avenue Southeast. Spark Reproductive Justice is hosting their eighth annual Legislate this event, Thursday, February 19th at 8.30 a.m. at Trinity United Methodist Church, 265 Washington Street Southwest. This is an opportunity for women of color, for queer youth to come out and meet their uh, representatives and lobby and discuss uh, issues that are important to them ranging from wages to expanding Medicaid. That will be Thursday, February 19th at 8.30 a.m. And that's our calendar for the next week. Thanks a lot. There are so many events really uh, in this progressive community we have here in Atlanta, um, numerous meetings, numerous kind of events. I did want to let folks know uh, last, uh, two, I guess it's two weeks ago now, we had Delisa Davis on, the sister of Kevin Davis, who was killed in his home uh, following his 911 call for help. Um, and the family had been really pressing that uh, the investigation get taken out of the hands of the police who were involved in the uh, shooting itself and into the um, auspices of the GBI. And so after a great deal of um, pressure that's been put on by a number of uh, rallies, including a sleep out that took place at the DeKalb Courthouse uh, last week. In fact, my understanding is, is that the uh, letter has gone to the GBI uh, requesting their investigation into this matter. Um, as most of us would feel that if we called 911 for help and then uh, we are the ones that are injured or killed by the police. This is a very serious matter and, uh, and certainly uh, something that all of us uh, need to make sure that police policies uh, don't kill innocent people. Um, I'm not sure, oh yeah, and we will um, mention again that there is I think Teacher's Day or Education Day at the Capitol is the 17th uh, next week Tuesday and as I said, there every day there are people who are um, going to the Capitol to talk to their legislators to try to make sure that this General Assembly enacts legislation which is helpful and supportive of working people, uh, children, the elderly, the sick, etc. And uh, it doesn't go for more tax breaks for the wealthy and uh, kind of boondoggle, sometimes really boondoggle big projects. We all remember, I think, the fishing center that was done for uh, when Sonny Purdue was in office. We're going to move uh, into a, a uh, promotional um, message from WRFG, and then you know, stay tuned and we will have Kwajalein Jackson on, and she is going to give us all kinds of information and background uh, facts and figures about the struggle to expand Medicaid, in other words, to bring all the people who have been left out uh, by the failure of the state to expand Medicaid, how we can uh, close this gap. So stay tuned. You are tuned into the Labor Forum here at WRFG. We're back. Uh, this is the Labor Forum here on WRFG 89.3 FM. I have to say, I was startled 
a little while ago because there's a metal awning outside the studio and all of a sudden pounding 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 but it has quieted so whatever that little brief uh, weather thing that just passed through Atlanta I hope everybody is okay those of you that were driving I'm sure it must have been startling too when all of a sudden you were being pelted by hail uh, but we're back uh, for our next uh, section of the labor forum. And we have a guest in the studio, Kwajalein Jackson. Hi, Kwajalein. It's so cool to see you again. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. And um, actually, earlier today, Kwajalein gave a uh, kind of educational briefing to more Monday Georgia folks about Medicaid expansion and exactly where it is in the state of Georgia at this moment. So perhaps we should start at the very beginning in case there's someone in our listening audience who doesn't quite understand uh, how it is after so many states have already uh, started this program, what it was that happened last year, can Georgia still get in on some of it, if so, yes, and how, <laughs> all those questions, so go for it. <laughs> sure, um, so just for a little bit of background, um, the, with the original implementation of the Affordable Care Act, the intention has always been for it to be a pathway for all Americans to have access to affordable health care. And that the, uh, the marketplace would provide federal subsidies for a portion of the population and that there would be funds set aside to um, raise the income um, eligibility for Medicaid so that they would meet and that the full range of people would be able to have access to care. Um, the Supreme Court made a decision that the uh, expansion of Medicaid um, which should be optional to the states and that um, several states decided to go ahead and expand at the implementation and other states did not and that was at the discretion of the governor um, of that state. Uh, Georgia was one that opted not to expand um, and uh, our, our governor has been um, pretty vocally opposed to um, the expansion of Medicaid. So um, it's been difficult for us to traverse in, in Georgia, but there have been many, many organizations and individuals and coalitions of people who continue to advocate. All right, so one of the things that happened last year was that uh, it was a, a, a gubernatorial election year, and so I think the, this is my, and I don't think it's my analysis alone, that the legislature took the decision away from the governor and put it into their own hands as to what would happen with this section of the Affordable Care Act. Exactly. If for fear that there might be a possibility that uh, Governor Deal would not win and that that, that would then uh, perhaps bring somebody into office who would have uh, put Georgia into the system. All right, so my understanding is, okay, so now the decision is in the hands of the legislature, and so, of course, they now are in the hot seat. Absolutely. Because all across the state, hundreds of thousands of people do not have any health coverage. Rural hospitals are closing or in real danger of closing. All kinds of, of uh, influential uh, doctors' associations, hospital associations are saying, why are you not doing this? So talk about that a little bit. Well, um, to be honest, I can't say exactly why um, our lawmakers have been so reluctant. Uh, we've heard lots of pushback uh, around the presumed cost to the state. Um, we just simply can't afford it because the because um, our budget is already strained and we need to be able to allocate to other areas. Um, there is some um, mistrust, perhaps, for lack of a better word, of the federal government following through on its end of the bargain of, of um, paying for the expansion. And just to clarify, within the first three years of the Affordable Care Act, um, expansion of Medicaid was is fully funded by the federal government and then after those three years it's funded at 90 percent for the next 10. Um, but there are still some um, who have been um, a little bit uh, suspicious and, and have said how do we know that the, the that the federal government will fulfill its part of the bargain and hold up um, its end and won't leave us um, kind of holding the bag. Um, and then there are also some even considering how much um, funding there is already earmarked for us uh, say that you know even that 10% that we might have to shoulder is still too much 
Um, there are those who really just don't um, want to um, bring more people into what they see as possibly an already flawed system. There are people who are really not fond of the way that Medicaid is functioning in Georgia anyway. So there's lots of pushback. Lots of folks that have a lot of feelings about why we can't. Um, but we all know, what many, many people know, um, there are so many more reasons why we can and should. Um, it's not too late. Uh, we can opt in to expand um, at any time. Um, and, and there's really little risk as well because, sh you know, we, the states can also um, choose to opt out um, if they find that it's not working for, um, for the state. And so we have so much to gain um, in helping with the health and, um, and well-being of our citizens that we really can't afford not to. Um, could you describe the affected population? Who would benefit if we were to do do the right thing? Sure. I mean, and there's a lot of of breadth of kinds of people who fall into what we're calling the coverage gap. And to explain that, um, it's this gap between where traditional Medicaid um, income eligibility stops and where the supplements um, and subsidies for the Affordable Care Act begin. Those people they make too much for one program and too little for another and have very few options. Many of them are, are working um, adults with no children. Um, many of them are in um, service industries, retail, um, food service, um, those kinds of careers. 52% uh, of them are women. Um, there are many um, veterans who fall into the coverage gap as well, who aren't able to get um, affordable care. It's, it, there's a, a lot of breadth and complexity to the, the kinds of people that fall into that space. And is there a number estimated? The, um, the estimated number is approximately 500,000 people who could be impacted if the coverage gap was, um, was fully covered. So, Tamika, I know you. You know uh, many of the workers that you help organize are people who would benefit from this. Could you talk about it a little bit? Yeah, uh, I've actually had the privilege to work with Quadrilla in the past around expanding Medicaid and closing the coverage gap. Uh, but you know, when you describe the affected, the impacted population, domestic workers fall right in the middle of that. Um, many of our members are older women. Uh, with no children or children who are out of the household who make too much for Medicaid or they don't meet the requirements um, and they make too little for the supplements and so what we have is a population of people who are working full-time who are unable to get affordable care which really undermines and defeats the purpose the spirit of the Affordable Care Act. Absolutely. I think it's really tragic that as we are trying so desperately to um, improve employment opportunities for, for people in Georgia, wouldn't it be wonderful for us to be able to have a healthy, more productive workforce who are able to um, be well in, in mind and body to be able to you know, give to the jobs that we want to try to create in this space? One of the things it seems to me, again, is that the workforce that is always impacted by these really just callous, uh, uh, cruel kinds of legislative decisions that are made at, whether it's the General Assembly or at Congress level, are always those that in, it seems to me that are the most connected to uh, issues of caring for people. Uh, and protecting people and uh, assisting people so that so that for example it's uh, the school bus drivers or the school cafeteria workers or the daycare people or the people who are helping uh, older folks or people that have disabilities in, in different kinds of you know assisted living or or you know whatever it's oftentimes the maids and the and the housekeepers at hotels and motels and hospitals. It, it's the low-wage hospital worker. It can, it, it's just all the people who uh, essentially keep everybody else healthy and, and going. 
and yet they are the ones that it just seems to me we we've talked on this program as well about this proposal again of Governor Deal to cut the health care insurance that's provided by the state for public school bus drivers um, you know who work a split shift don't work anything close to 40 hours a week because you don't drive a bus eight and ten hours a day um, and yet they're the ones that can be sacrificed so that as we see tax incentives breaks get given to corporations that are so profitable to get them to move here to build here to expand here so so let's talk a little bit about then how it is that Cover Georgia, which you are associated with, Kwajalein, and the National Domestic Workers Alliance that you are working with, Tamika, and Paul and I, who are retired union members who fortunately have some health insurance through our unions, um, how and what it is that we as a group can do to put some, I don't know, a pressure put some I don't know, put some backbone in these folks to accept money that we as Georgians have already paid into this health care pot. Well, um, there are as I mentioned earlier, there are many groups and individuals who feel really passionately about this and are working really hard to um, coordinate um, efforts to to really push for closing the coverage gap. There were groups, um, have been groups lobbying since the start of the session, um, talking to legislators regularly about how much we stand to gain um, from closing the coverage gap. And there has been some softening. Um, and I can't speak to the specifics about um, you know, which legislators are, are, are movable, but, but there are some that are, are listening and, and, and answering questions um, and asking different kinds of questions than they were during the last session. And so there is some optimism that can be held. We have some options. Um, there are some um, who are really not comfortable with traditional expansion, but may have a little bit more comfort with some sort of waiver program, as we've seen in some other states. Um, and so that's still an opportunity. Um, where Georgia can really craft something that they feel, that we feel um, may be better suited um, for the constraints that our budget has or the ways in which we feel it will work best with our population. And so that's still an option to get um, at least the access to care to hundreds of thousands of more people. Could you talk a little bit more about this waiver program because that, as you mentioned, there are several states that have gotten permission from the federal government to kind of alter some aspects of uh, what was called Medicaid expansion, is now sort of more being termed about uh, closing the gap. Uh, what, what would those, what would it look like? We've seen it look like a lot of different things, um, depending on the states. Um, some have um, some options where um, they include some additional requirements on um, recipients of, of coverage where there may be um, some small premiums associated with it that are not normally associated with, um, with Medicaid coverage. Um, we have seen some groups that have asked for um, uh, some changing in the wraparound services that are typically offered to the Medicaid population and making it a slightly different for those in the GAP population. Um, but oftentimes they, they will um, mirror a lot of the elements of traditional Medicaid but just be slightly different depending on what the needs of that organization or what that state um, is looking to do. The good thing about a waiver process, however, is as along the approval process, there are multiple opportunities for public comment. Um, and so before it's submitted to um, uh, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, uh, or CMS, uh, there's a, a public comment period, and then once this has been submitted up again, there is a second public comment period. And what we've heard from folks on the ground in other states where they've gone through a waiver process, that public comment period has been really, really impactful on um, protecting some of the elements of Medicaid that, that, that groups have really felt was important to maintain. 
um, keeping, for example, um, uh, uh, work search requirements off the table and other kinds of you know barriers that we know would would reduce people's ability to keep their coverage or blackout periods if someone misses a premium payment. Those kinds of things in, in many cases have been not been approved when they've been asked for and partially because of how the resounding um, uh, opposition from the public. So it's really important for advocates and individuals um, to stay engaged so that when these opportunities to lift our voices present themselves, we can be united on that. Well, I'm going to ask again, so if it, from what you know about uh, the situation here in Georgia, it seemed to me that when they did polling last year, uh, when the possibility was that it was the governor uh, who could approve it, the, all the polls showed the vast majority of people in Georgia, all demographics, all across the state, wanted this expansion. And it's logical. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that is so, I find to be so ironic is, uh, for example, Governor Deal and the politicians in this state have no problem asking for millions and millions and millions and billions of dollars for deepening the port of Savannah. That federal money is fine. They got no problem with millions and millions and millions of dollars for uh, highway expansion. That federal money is fine. There's so much federal money for education, and that's fine. So it just is, um, it's, not, it's not ironic, it's like crazy, <laughs> absolutely crazy and irrational uh, to balk at literally millions of dollars that would help save lives. Mm -hmm. And as you said, the money that we've already spent, that is already coming out of the tax dollars of Georgia citizens that is helping to um, keep citizens in other states healthy. And you know, with the federal, the federal dollars part, the federal government has actually never broken their end of the agreement to provide states with federal dollars. You know, so not just are we already budgeting year after year with federal dollars as a part of our budgeting process, there's also never been a broken agreement. And so when you talk about irrational, there, there aren't previous examples to say, well, look, if we expand Medicaid, we're afraid we'll end up carrying this burden because of this example. It literally doesn't exist. So let me ask a question. Uh, so what those that are... Um, refusing to, to take these, this federal money for health care. Is it only ideological? Are they being backed by um, you know, some kinds of big money entities that don't want it? It seems to me that the insurance companies are making a lot of money off of the fact that this is not as most people who study health care say there should be a single payer get rid of the insurance companies altogether. This has made a lot of money for insurance companies the way that this program has worked out. Um, the pharmaceutical companies would make money. So who is it or what is it that has caused so many states? Is it just total uh, opposition to Obama? Go ahead, tell me. <laughs> so, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's, I think, in the southern states, which also are the states with the most amount of people who would benefit from the expansion of Medicaid, it appears to be ideological because all of the pushback that's given actually isn't rooted, none of those pushbacks are rooted in fact. And we have some pretty outspoken um, Republican governors who are not fans of our current president who have expanded Medicaid, like... Jan Brewer uh, and Arizona. Arizona, right. And ultimately the logic is this is good for my people, right? And so ultimately when you're putting the people in your state first, really this is a no-brainer. But there's an enclave here in the South uh, that has chosen 
to, it appears, again, to remain on, I guess, party lines and, and ideologically oppose the expansion of Medicaid. Well, I have to say, my first thought is, of course, this is the Confederate South and that this legacy, as we talk about on this program so many times, that that legacy of slavery, that, that legacy of institutionalized racism um, has caused many, many times where the actual good of, of, of an individual person to a group of people is sacrificed just because of bigotry and discrimination. Yeah. So. It's really unfortunate. I was reading earlier today, um, uh, it, was, it was brought up as we were meeting earlier with the, with the group from, um, from Moral Monday, Georgia, that the Tennessee um, Medicaid waiver failed in, in their legislature. And there was a quote in the article that I read that said, if it had been called Bubacare as opposed to Obamacare, then it would probably have passed with flying colors. And I'm, I'm saddened that, that, that there would be so much kind of rooted, um, you know, ideologically um, that would supersede um, really seeing the needs of people. And so, I, again, I try really hard to be optimistic about our General Assembly and, and really trust that they, they understand and, and recognize the opportunity that lies before them. Um, to really make a difference, um, and it doesn't have to be, um, uh, you know, completely um, in line with uh, what they what they believe to be um, federal overreach or something like that. It can really just be about um, putting um, taking a stand on behalf of Georgia citizens um, and investing in the future of Georgia. Um, that's really what I'd like to see happen. Um. We were talking earlier about intersectionality, and when you said that there's 52% of this affected population that are women, and I'm looking at the intersection of race, gender, and class here, yeah. can you talk about how uh, not expanding Medicaid particularly affects women of color and things like re reproductive rights, I'm, I'm thinking as an example. Absolutely. Um, so. Uh, as Tamika brought up earlier, there, um, the health disparities that exist, particularly in the southeastern states, is abysmal. You know, one, one big example is um, Georgia's maternal mortality rate, which um, in 2013 was... Maternal. Maternal mortality. So these are women who um, die um, as a result of or associated with their pregnancy, either um, during delivery or within the first year after delivery. And, and in 2013, we were 50th in the nation. Um, and we've um, since, um, the last numbers I've seen, we've ticked up to 49. But, um, but, you know, that's one example of a space where expanding access to comprehensive health care before women get pregnant, as well as after they deliver, could have you know, significant impact on their health and well-being. And that maternal death rate is, is um, disproportionately higher for black women in Georgia than for any other ethnic group. Are you saying that Medicaid would cover prenatal, that there would be some connection there? There could be. So right now, Medicaid ex covers prenatal care, um, but after delivery, um, women's um, coverage drops off. Um, and it's and it, a lot of times that that care is very focused on the health of the of the infant, and it doesn't always um, really extend as comprehensively for the health of the woman. And there are some um, some cases where women have some chronic conditions that might be impacted by a pregnancy that might be present before they get pregnant, but might be exacerbated by that pregnancy. And if so, they have, if they have access to preventative um, care before conception, that that could be a way to really improve the outcomes of, of uh, labor and delivery and their health beyond um, the birth of their child. And would you guess there's a connection um, when you're talking about uh, this is a life or death issue, literally. Absolutely. Uh, about the closing of the rural hospitals, that that's where this is happening, where it's going to have the worst effect. Absolutely. There are um, there are areas, geographic areas, where people would have to travel upwards of 300 miles to get to 
um, emergency care um, or specialized care. Um, and so, and there's, um, we've seen some reports of, you know, when thinking specifically about reproductive health, um, the um, the spaces in which the access to um, an OBGYN is is growing more and more sparse in parts of the uh, parts of the state, and so it has significant impact on on people who already again are, have some um, pretty abysmal health outcomes and um, need to have access to more wraparound care. Um, I think that there are a lot of healthcare providers who would like to be seeing more patients in those spaces. Um, but you know, may be challenged by the by the the limits of what they who they can see because of um, the healthcare um, coverage that those citizens have. That seems to me that that's possibly one of the reasons why some of the people that you have mentioned, some of the legislators, are actually giving it a second look, because uh, this crisis that's really happening in rural Georgia, where hospitals have closed. That means not just the hospital, it means a lot of jobs, and then it means a lot of other things that were around the hospital, everything from cafes and restaurants and gas stations and all the rest, uh, also closed down. And then that just is, is a domino effect in small towns. So that I, I think that it's been readily seen that if this rural population, many of whom would be positively affected, by closing this coverage gap, uh, were able to contribute some money financially to these hospitals when they went to visit, not flood emergency rooms, but go for regular visits and have regular care, that this would have a big impact, not just uh, in terms of people's health, but economically. So I want to ask you a, that question yeah. about one of the things that was mentioned last year was the many tens of thousands of jobs that could be brought to Georgia in the health field if this program was, this federal money was accepted? So um, some of the estimates that I've seen is that um, closing the coverage gap could create um, more than 70,000 jobs in the state of Georgia and could generate economic activity um, of uh, $276 million a year in local revenue. Um, and uh, that that those, as you said, would have ripple effects beyond just the healthcare industry, and that it would have all kinds of impact beyond that. And you know, thinking kind of long term, how much more attractive would we be as a state for um, for large scale economic de um, development and investment by larger companies if we have. Um, a healthier workforce where people coming in from um, other industries would have access to um, state-of-the-art health care and hospitals and um, mm -hmm. wait times in emergency rooms were not astronomical like those those kinds of things um, I know that many corporations and businesses consider when they're thinking about places they mm -hmm. want to be planted um, because they want to make sure that their workforce has all the resources to make that space attractive so um, we know that closing the coverage gap could have lots of benefits for the state beyond just the health, the health and well-being of people. I want to raise one other issue that was, has been brought up is that uh, we've had many times fast food workers on and other part-time workers, workers who just, uh, their employer just don't, don't, will not give them 40 hours, whether it's a Walmart or uh, a Wendy's or whoever. And there certainly was a lot of, uh, I don't know if it actually turned out to be very true, but there was a lot of uh, hype about how when the uh, Affordable Care Act came into being, that employers were in fact going to cut lots of workers' hours back so that they didn't have to pay their health insurance. I was just wondering if you knew whether that was in fact true, and if it is true, um, how, how that actually becomes another reason why this should should be expanded. Well, I don't have a lot of, of detail about how widespread that phenomenon was. It is something that we heard quite a bit about. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that occurred in some spaces. But um, there, as a part of the um, 
the intention of the Affordable Care Act. There are also some subsidies for, for businesses to be able to expand um, health care coverage for their employees. Um, so to make it affordable to business owners um, to make that investment in their people. And so I would hope that small businesses would be able to take advantage of that um, in order to, again, invest in their people. Um, but if we did expand um, and close the coverage gap, um, ideally, even in those situations where folks were not covered by their employer, people would have an option to go to, go to and have an alternative space mm -hmm. where they could get affordable care. It's really the bottom line is we just want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to be covered um, in a way that they can afford based on what they're making. You know, we say many times on this program and in many demonstrations that health care is a human right. Yes. And so the, the part of the problem, uh, you know, with this uh, the Affordable Care Act is that it has all come down to dollars and cents. And it still is a question of how much money you make and uh, as to whether you get health care. You either have to be really, really poor or you, <laughs> in any event, you still have to pay something. And um, it just... As we, as we look oftentimes around the globe, we've, we see that the United States, this huge industrial megapower, you know, supposedly the major power in the world, sits alone among all the industrialized countries and many, many poor countries in being the only place that doesn't grant health care, just like it does education, just like it does a road, just like it does a library. These are all considered just the things that you have because you live there. When Kwajalein mentioned uh, Georgia's maternal mortality rate that we were 50 <laughs> and now have ticked up to 49, mm -hmm. I just wanted to put that in context to the United States maternal mortality rate. We are not in the top 10 and we're not in the top 20 countries when it comes to the maternal mortality rate of our pregnant women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just to put that into concept, concept Georgia's behind twice. <laughs> right, right, right. So, Quadrant, in the last couple of minutes here, if you've got a whole series, there, this is a big topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's lots of moving parts going on at the state capitol, uh, as well as in Congress, about all the things that people in this country need. And we started the program off talking about really what had the devastation that occurred in Greece and in Spain and, and here as well where the vast amount of public money has been shifted into private hands. Um, if you wouldn't mind giving our listeners some other resources and other avenues where they can become engaged in this struggle, because as we have said, this is life and death for literally tens of thousands of people. I think the figure is that roughly 6,000 plus people have died here in Georgia just because Medicaid was not expanded. So um, I, uh, I work with Feminist Women's Health Center, and I, I think I neglected to say that at the beginning. Um, and we as an organization are a member of the Cover Georgia Coalition, as, and um, National Domestic Workers Alliances as well. And um, so that is a coalition of, uh, of many um, industry professionals, um, grassroots organizations, um, uh, and uh, consumer advocates um, that are working collectively on these issues. And so you can look to CoverGeorgia.org to get more information about the organizations that are involved. They have toolkits there and some uh, materials that can be downloaded that have um, some of the most recent statistics um, and some of the data around how much we're losing in money, how many people are impacted, and that kind of information. Um, I know that um, this is a core issue of, uh, of Moral Monday Georgia um, and um, something that they remain committed to. Um, and so um, there were, again, there were groups that have been um, uh, lobbying today, um, but I would imagine that this is going to remain um, a key mm -hmm. issue through the rest of the session, and so that's another organization that um, that folks can reach out to to get connected. Um, and um, trying to think if there's another that comes to mind. Um, Tamika, do you have hmm? maybe pro Georgia? Oh, absolutely, that's a great one. So pro Georgia as well. So pro Georgia.org, and that's um, pro Georgia spelled out. Um, 
uh, org um, is another coalition of organizations that um, that are working on several um, uh, progressive issues, and they actually have a um, a ticker on their website that shows how many dollars lost every day um, that we choose not to cover close the coverage gap um, and have some some additional resources and ways that folks can plug in. Uh, so those would be the three I'd recommend. Well, thank you so much, Kwasalyn. I really think that you uh, provided our audience and the three of us with uh, a lot more information. We really appreciate your being here on the Labor Forum. Uh, we'll be back again next Monday uh, on the 16th of February. Uh, we're going to have Ajin Poe call in. Um, please do uh, tune in. Again, this is Diane Mathewitz saying goodbye. Thank you for coming in today. It's great to have this information. My pleasure. I, I'm honored to be here, and I'm happy to, to support WRFG anytime I'm asked. Terrific. Thank you.